Can you be so fit that you die? I asked that question in the second ever video I uploaded to this channel, but today I want to ask a slightly different one, which is, can you be so fit that you don't die, but you have significant health problems? That previous video, which really was my roll away success, it's all been downhill since then, concerned cyclists that push their bodies so far that they actually place themselves at risk of death due to a combination of a very slow heart rate and thick blood prone to clotting. But the key point here is that in the case of elite cyclists, professionals in the 1990s particularly that I was talking about, they achieved this kind of superhuman state with drugs. And that if you don't take performance enhancing drugs, you're not going to develop that pasta sauce blood but does that mean that extreme exercise in the absence of drugs is completely safe? That's what we're going to answer in today's video. This video is sponsored by NordVPN, which is my personal choice for VPN that I use every day, especially when I'm abroad, I'm on holiday in India at the moment. Find out how to get a huge discount at the end of the video. Now, statistically, I don't think many professional cyclists are watching this channel, but I imagine lots of you are keen on getting out on your bike, just like I am. Probably you're far more serious about it than me, or you're keen runners or swimmers. As I said, I'm on holiday in India right now, and when I go running around the local lake in the morning, I've got loads of company, lots of people exercising. We're seeing increase in popularity of Tough Mudders and Survival of the Fittest and all these kinds of races. So I think endurance sport is going through a popular phase right now, which is fantastic. And some of you are doing enough exercise to qualify you as an athlete in, in medical terms, or perhaps that describes a loved one. So this video is for you. And indeed, I've had a lot of requests for this video because there have been some scary headlines in the press that too much exercise is harmful. And I think this message is now quite widely believed, particularly in sort of sports circles. But how valid is it? For those of you that haven't watched the channel before, my name my name is Rohan, I'm a consultant cardiologist in the UK, and I'm going to be focusing on the cardiovascular system. I will mention the musculoskeletal system too, but for reasons that I think are probably fairly clear, you know about the musculoskeletal system already, because if you're running so much that you're damaging your knees, you know about it, it hurts. But with the heart, sometimes it's not obvious if any damage is occurring until much later. And the videos that I found about this either massively oversimplify it or they're just plain wrong. So I want this to be useful and I've also divided it up with uh, chapter markings below. Let me start by clearly stating one thing because I know what you jokers are going to put in the comments, you lazy bums. Oh, exercise is bad. I knew it. Th that's all I needed to hear, doc. Thanks for the warning. Back to the couch for me. Can't be too careful. You're not funny, okay? Exercise is flipping amazing. It has such a multitude of benefits, not just on your heart, mental well-being, diabetes, blood pressure, chronic pain, cancer risk. These are all based on good evidence. The list goes on and on. The general recommendation in most countries is half an hour of moderate exercise five times a week, which could be as simple as walking or half an hour's more vigorous exercise three times a week. If you go from sedentary and let's be blunt, I think a lot of people these days do qualify as having a sedentary lifestyle through no, no fault of our own office jobs, whether working from home or sitting in a cubicle have proliferated in recent years. And so we do tend to spend most of our time sitting still. So if you go from sedentary to building in any form of regular exercise, you will reap incredible benefits because there's probably nothing else you can do in your life to improve your health more aside from maybe giving up smoking. Now, please don't take up smoking just so you can quit it. It doesn't work like that. Exercise beats any other activity for its overall effects on health. So until we discover a way to age backwards, it's the king. Definitely more useful than any particular diet your favorite influencer claims made them so attractive. I made a whole love letter to exercise in the form of a video which you can watch here. Now, almost 90% of Americans don't do enough exercise. And fellow Europeans, I know we like to look down our noses at the Americans when it comes to food. And we're correct to do that. Their food is terrible. But when it comes to obesity, the UK is uh, leading the charge to catch up with the US. It's not that far behind. And uh, Europe is also not faring so well. And when it comes to exercise levels, I was surprised that it's pretty similar across the board. So exercise is good and you should do it. Disclaimer out of the way. But if exercise is a wonder drug, and it is, does that mean that more of a good thing means more rewards? Well, 
As with any drug, you can probably guess that's not the case. You need to aim for the optimal dose. And we talk about exercise dose in the literature because sometimes that enjoyment becomes an addiction. The euphoria that exercise can produce can make you exercise more and more. Even those of us who don't compete at a high level, we use apps like Strava and step counters and Apple watches and wearables and so on. New ways to quantify our own exercise and compete not only with ourselves, but each other. Of course, excessive exercise can cause other issues like the musculoskeletal effects that I mentioned earlier. Sore knees, Achilles tendonitis, tennis elbow, chafing boom. I know all this from bitter personal experience. I completely trashed my knees by 10 years of training several times a week on a very fast, hard athletics track in my youth when I was a serious 400 meter runner. And even many years later, I ran a half marathon about six years ago, and that took my right knee out, honestly, for about three years. And musculoskeletal problems, of course, dominate strength training, but we're focusing on EEE, extreme endurance exercise. I'm talking about the marathon runners, the triathletes, the ultra swimmers, the iron men and iron women, the iron people who live in a primitive Iron Age society where they evolved Nike vapor flies before the ability to talk about anything except running. We get it, Dave. Stop telling me about it. The people going out several days a week for an hour or more of hard exercise. You would assume that if exercise is good, then more of it should be better. But there's this interesting U-shaped curve when it comes to the effect on your health. Let's look at the Y-axis here and say that this is your overall health risk. In some of the studies, it's cardiovascular risk and some it's all cause. So the higher up on the Y axis, the higher your risk, you want to be low. And then on the X axis here, we've got the amount of exercise from none all the way to these ultra exercises. And as we begin going from no exercise, where you have a very high overall risk with a bit of exercise, your risk drops precipitously and you get a huge benefit around a point which, surprise, surprise, is in line with guidelines for how much people should be doing. We don't just pluck them out of, out of nowhere. So that is associated with a huge benefit and reduction in your risk. Then the first thing to notice, and there were lots of studies done, but one particular big study confirmed a lot of this, which was over 600,000 people. But there were multiple different observational studies looking, which proved the first thing to say, which is there's a plateau phase, which means that at a, after a certain point, even if you start, if you, even if you do more exercise, you, you have a law of diminishing return. So you get fewer benefits for quite a considerable increase in exercise. But you're not coming to any harm yet. However, this in particular, this big study showed an uptick when you got to a certain level of exertion, of exercise, then risk started climbing again. And that was this very interesting U-shaped curve. Let's be clear. Extreme athletes' risk of adverse events is lower than someone who does no exercise. I've seen a Tech Insider video that suggested that they were comparable. They're absolutely not. But they, the risk is definitely higher than in someone who does a moderate amount of exercise. There appears to be a sweet spot when it comes to exercise, which is an important message. So what's going on? Well, extreme exercise isn't entirely benign. If you measure the blood troponin, this is a little chemical we measure in the bloodstream, it shouldn't be detectable in your peripheral bloodstream unless something is going on in the heart, whether there's been a bit of damage to the heart. So it goes up in a heart attack, but it also goes up in 50% of marathon runners if you take their blood after the race. So that's an abnormal finding. And if you put these people into an MRI scanner to scan their heart, you get a transient, subtle reduction in heart function, which recovers completely. But this, we believe, is reflective of this mild irritation or inflammation of the heart, although you can't actually see the inflammation on the scan because it's so subtle, but you see the effects. And repeated small inflammatory challenges like this, we think eventually lead to microscopic scarring and fibrosis, which can cause electrical problems. Having said all of that, there have been some studies heavily publicized in the media that really were scaremongering or over-exaggerated. You may have seen articles suggesting that there are higher rates of coronary artery disease in athletes or that athletes die earlier. And these are wrong. I'll talk a bit more about them. But even the most extreme 
athletes still live longer than sedentary people. So that's another key thing to take home. Let's start with what has the best evidence. And the main risk from endurance exercise is something called atrial fibrillation. This is where the top chambers of the heart, instead of beating in a nice coordinated way, they're called the atria, they stop contracting normally and they start sort of quivering, they, they fibrillate, so they just kind of lose efficiency. And the overall efficiency of the heart decreases, in some people, quite considerably, maybe about 30%. And atrial fibrillation's main impact is that it can also risk increase your risk of having a stroke. So we start a lot of these people on anticoagulation, blood thinning medication. The rate of atrial fibrillation, or AF, is five times higher among veteran athletes than those that don't exercise often. But, and this is important, if you look up atrial fibrillation on Wikipedia, you'll see that it's associated with stroke and higher rates of death and heart failure. However, this is not the same pattern we see in athletes with atrial fibrillation. Most people get atrial fibrillation from high blood pressure, excess alcohol, heart disease, or valve disease, heart valve disease, and they don't do so well. But the atrial fibrillation we see in athletes' hearts seems to be more benign, or it's similar, but they've dropped their overall cardiovascular risk so much from their exercise that it offsets the increased risk. So atrial fibrillation is a risk, but it doesn't seem to be as aggressive as other people with atrial fibrillation. When I'm trying to remember demographic features about what kind of person is likely to develop a, a disorder, I think of kind of a model patient, stereotypical patient. And for this, I'm thinking of a man, 40 to 60 years old, and tall. Yes, in yet another win for short people, you've got a lower risk of developing atrial fibrillation uh, with extreme exercise more comfortable flying on planes, more likely to get a match if you need a heart transplant, surprisingly large amount of scientific evidence that tall people die earlier than short people, and now this. Truly, the short will inherit the earth. Well, anyway, so this model patient um, also has been involved in high-level sport for a total of 1,500 hours, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's quite a lot when you think about it, of intense exertion in their lives. Now, we think this is caused by a number of mechanisms related to the fact that athletes' hearts enlarge slightly. You get repeated atrial stretch, inflammation in the tissue, and you start accumulating these little micro scars that I mentioned, or fibrosis. A senior colleague of mine used to describe this as the difference between a brand new CD and one that's been left out of the box lying around and it's kind of picked up some scratches and gone a bit dull. And if you're old enough, to get that analogy, then you're probably about the right age to worry about this. What about coronary artery disease? I said I'd talk about those studies that have suggested that there is increased coronary calcification in athletes, uh, which surely is a bad thing. Well, it, it is complicated, this one. For a start, the relationship isn't entirely clear. Yes, there does appear to be more calcified plaques in the coronary arteries of athletes, and generally, calcification in coronary arteries is not a good thing. But we haven't seen that that translates to clinically significant heart disease. In other words, there's a bit of Lyme scale present, but it doesn't seem to be causing a problem. I think more research needs to be done on that. Some other things you might have heard about are electrical issues. Now, we've already discussed atrial fibrillation, which is where the heart becomes irregular. But there's some evidence to suggest that the fibrosis can also affect not only the atria, but the ventricles, the main pumping chambers, and might cause abnormal ventricular rhythms, although I would hesitate to say anything too definitive on this. There are dangers caused by a very slow heart rate. Yes, you can be more prone to fainting, but it is not accurate to say that athletes need pacemakers at a higher rate than non-athletes. We haven't observed that. Some of this stuff, like the atrial fibrillation, I think is pretty black and white. But some of the other things we mentioned, like the coronary calcification and electrical issues, um, is based on evidence that I think how much weight you put on it is going to be a bit subjective. But the key message here should be that you don't need to be committing hours and hours of your life to feeling the burn and embracing the pain. Just exercise in a fun way. Exercise should be fun. It should be something you look forward to. What I hope I've shown is that you don't need to be doing that much exercise to reap enormous rewards. And that's why we have the recommendations in the form that they are. They're not plucked out of nowhere, but they are intended for everyone. They are a minimum recommendation and by all means do more, but the more exercise you do, your additional benefits accrue less rapidly. And there's a long plateau phase where 
you're not necessarily that much better off if you're doing 10 hours a week versus five. But hey, if you're having fun, go for it. And you should not be worrying about the risks from excessive exercise as they affect people who really, really are serious athletes doing way more exercise than regular Joes, certainly much more than I do. And I think I'm quite an active person. So if your attention span is not as long as your cycle route and you just want to kind of have a prescriptive amount, then I would say for most people watching this, who probably skewed to the younger end of the overall population spectrum, I would say that it should be about five hours per week of moderate exercise, which could be as simple as walking, or 2.5 hours of more intense exercise. This is a bit higher than some guidelines, but I'm modifying this based on the demographics that typically watch this channel. And I still think it's a realistic um, goal for most people. But remember, the key message is anything is better than nothing. In an ideal world, we'd be on the move most of the day, but that's not always possible with the nature of work in the 21st century. Yet another reason to be part of the anti-work movement. Risks can be mitigated by diversifying your exercise. Don't spend all of your time lifting weights or running miles on the road. Mix it up and you aren't much less likely to suffer these adverse effects of extreme exercise. And most importantly, don't compete with Dave on Strava with his 100 kilometers every day Fuck Dave. And likewise, don't shame anyone for their lack of fitness. Encourage them. If all else fails, have a couple of kids and you'll never sit still again. So why is this so important? Why am I as a cardiologist so passionate about this? Why am I making this video? Because most Americans in surveys, and I'm sure this is the same elsewhere, think you need to be in the gym or really working up a sweat to improve your health. So they get put off. But gardening, Hoovering, walking, yoga, sex, although let's be honest, I'm not sure many of you are going to make half an hour. Dancing, so many activities are exercise and they just get your body moving. When I was uh, going around the lake uh, this morning, every hundred meters I saw a local exercise club, aunties and uncles just getting their bodies moving. Try and be in motion for a bit every day and build in a small amount of more vigorous exercise every week. And I promise you, you will change your life. I'm on the roof of my in-law's house in Bangalore. It's a beautiful, sunny monsoon evening. Dogs are barking peacefully. Um, yes, perfect conditions for yoga, you might think. But in fact, there's only one activity that I'm planning right now. At work. And when I say work, of course I mean about 50% Netflix, but I can't actually access uh, my NHS email from here. I can't access loads of Netflix content, videos in the news like uh, sports and news videos. You know, I can't see the whole match when I'm on holiday, but I want to see the goals or the knockouts. And I keep getting this is not available in your region. When my kids ask to watch Ang, I want to watch Ang, which is what they call Avatar, it's just not available here. But luckily, I've got NordVPN set up, so it's very simple. I just mark my location as back in the UK or New York or wherever and can access all the usual content that I want. There are over five and a half thousand locations in 59 countries. I just open the map, one click, and it's done. And this is one is going out specifically to my massive viewership in Japan and much of the Francophone world because my video with Zabina Hossenfelder uh, from a few months ago has been age restricted and also geographically restricted. So viewers in French Guyana, for example, can no longer access it. And my friends, that is a big problem. Yes, the combination of medicine and physics is just too inflammatory. So use NordVPN to stick two fingers up to YouTube telling you that you can't watch two nerds sitting in a room talking about science. And honestly, changing my geographic location is the main reason I use a VPN. The security stuff is great, but there are people watching who will know far more about that than me. So I'll just tell you the reasons that I chose NordVPN. I can use it on six devices, including my TV, so I don't have to watch everything on a laptop. And it's more than just a VPN because it's got malware protection. Protection, protection. And it's more than just a VPN because it's got malware protection, which blocks intrusive ads and web trackers. And for you, dear Medlife Crisis viewer, I have a special exclusive deal if you go to nordvpn.com forward slash Medlife Crisis and sign up today to get a free month and a massive discount. And it's risk free because there's Nord's 30 day money back guarantee. Sign up today to make sure you can always watch Ang. And of course, it's a great way to support me making more videos. Thanks for watching.